Many years ago, there was an emperor so exceedingly fond of new clothes that he spent all his money on being well-dressed. Hi everyone, my name's SJ. And my name is T. And we're Crumbs of Science. And this week, if you couldn't tell, we are talking about the Hans Christian Andersen tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. This is one that you've probably heard about before in school, and it's really quite a simple tale. Very easy to tell the morals in this one. There's no Disney version of The Emperor's New Clothes, although there is The Emperor's New Groove, which has similar morals. You've got an emperor who's not that nice. Yeah, I suppose might and he's be... quite vain and he learns to... That is true. I don't know. I don't think the emperor in this one learns anything. Oh, he does. He's He's learned something at the end. The tale goes that the emperor didn't care anything about caring for the kingdom or making sure that he was being a good ruler. The only thing he cared about was making sure that he had a good-looking outfit on. They had a lovely saying, which was, the king's in council, the emperor's in his dressing room. Lived in a place where everything was good, so it's all right that he was a bit of a sucky ruler because life was going okay for them. One day, there came to town two swindlers who said that they were weavers and that they could weave the most magnificent fabrics imaginable. And there was something very special about these clothes. Not only were their colours and patterns uncommonly fine, but clothes made of this cloth had a wonderful way of becoming invisible to anyone who was unfit for his office or who was unusually stupid. Those would be just the clothes for me, thought the emperor. If I wore them, I'd be able to discover which men in my empire are unfit for their posts, and I could tell the wise man from the fools. Yes, I must certainly get some of the stuff woven for me right away. So he forks over a large sum of money to start work immediately. And the swindlers... They've got him, hooked him in. They set up their looms, which is what they used to use in olden times to weave cloths, and they put nothing on there. They demanded all the exciting materials to make this cloth, so fine silk and gems, gold, but they put all of it into their bags and still just set up on this empty loom, clickety clack, going ahead, weaving nothing, which really is a great deception, it seems. And so the emperor thought, I'd like to know how those weavers are getting on with that cloth. But he felt slightly uncomfortable because he remembered that those who were unfit for their position would not be able to see the fabric. Now, it couldn't mean that he doubted himself, yet he thought he'd rather send someone else to see how things were going. The whole town knew about the cloth's particular power now, and they were all impatient to find out how stupid their neighbours were. So the first person that the emperor decides to send is his minister, because he thinks he's very smart, fit for his job. Minister turns up, can't see anything. But the swindlers, because it seems like they were pretty good actors, described the cloth to him, saying it about the excellent pattern and the beautiful colours. However, this poor old minister still couldn't see anything, but he didn't want anyone to know that he was a fool. So he just pretended that he could see it. So he said, it's beautiful, it's enchanting, such a pattern, what colours? I'll be sure to tell the emperor how delighted I am with it. The minister went back to the emperor and pretended that he saw the fabric and described to him how amazing and wonderful it truly was. Swindlers, of course, immediately asked for more money, more silk, more gold thread, so they can make more of the clothes. But all of it went straight into their pockets. Never a thread went onto the looms, though they worked at their weaving, in scare quotes, as hard as ever. The emperor then thought, I'll send another trustworthy official to see how it's going. That official, the same thing happened as to the minister. He looked and he looked, but he could, as there was nothing on the looms, he couldn't see anything. The swindlers went, oh, isn't it a beautiful piece of goods? And they displayed and described their imaginary pattern. And this other official thought, oh, I'm not stupid, so it must be that I'm unworthy. Hmm, I mustn't let anyone know. So he praised the material he didn't see. He said he was delighted. And to the emperor, he said, it held me spellbound. So finally, the emperor decides that he's got to go see this cloth. So he goes along with a band of people, two of them the ministers who had already gone to see the fabric, and he couldn't see anything. He didn't want anyone to realise that he was 
unintelligent and unfit to be emperor. So he pretended that he could see it as well and said, oh, it's very pretty. It has my highest approval. The whole team that he had brought with him stared, but not wanting the emperor to think that they were foolish, continued to compliment the clothes and say how wonderful they were. The emperor even gave the swindlers a cross to wear in their buttonhole and the title of Sir Weaver. All the emperor's advisors advised him, you need to wear these amazing clothes in your procession that you're going to do tomorrow. And so before the procession, the swindlers stayed up all night and burned more than six candles to show just how busy they were finishing the emperor's new clothes. They pretended to take the cloth off the loom. They made cuts in the air with huge scissors. And at last they said, now the emperor's new clothes are ready for him. Then the emperor himself came with his noblest noblemen, and the swindlers raised up their arms as if they were holding something, saying, here are the trousers, here are the coat, here's the mantle. All of them are as light as a spider web. One would, might always think that he had nothing on, but that's what makes them so fine. Exactly. All the noblemen agreed, though they could see nothing, because there was nothing to see. So everyone complimented him. He assumed that he was ready, assumed that he looked fantastic went outside and everyone who was to carry his long train behind him, because of course that was the height of fashion at the time, reached down to the floor and pretended to pick it up. And so the emperor went off in his procession under his splendid canopy and all of his subjects were in the streets and saying to each other, oh, how fine are the emperor's new clothes? Don't they fit him to perfection? And see his long train? Although no one could see anything, no one would admit this because they didn't want to be seen as unfit for their positions or a fool. But then the tiny voice of a child was heard through the clamour in the crowd saying, but he hasn't got anything on. He hasn't got anything on. A child says he hasn't got anything on. But he hasn't got anything on, the whole town cried out at last. And the emperor shivered, because he suspected they were right. But he thought, this procession has got to go on. So he walked more proudly than ever, as all his noblemen held the train that wasn't there at all. A very simple tale of morals, I think, of honesty, um, vanity, don't trust swindlers. So this is a Hans Christian Andersen tale, as we said, and it was first published on the 7th of April in 1837 and was part of his third and final instalment of his Anderson's fairy tales told for children. The original version of this story was published in 1335 in the book Libro de los Ejemplos, which is Book of the Examples, by Count Lucanor or Juan Manuel, who was the Prince of Villena. And this version of the story was the king and the three imposters. And it's very similar in terms of the king is presented with a cloth But the people who can't see the cloth in that version are actually people who are of illegitimate birth. So everyone says that they can see it, especially the king, because he doesn't want to think that he's a bastard and therefore would not be fit for his position. And at the time, being of illegitimate birth was considered quite a controversy. So everyone pretends that they can see it until finally it's not actually a child who steps forward, but it is a black person who at the time was considered to not have anything to lose by admitting that they couldn't see anything. And then suddenly the whole, the same thing happens. The whole crowd swells um, and everyone realises that the king is actually wearing no clothes. And Anderson didn't see this, the original Spanish version, but he did see a German translation of it, which I had to Google translate this because I do not speak any German, but the translation was, that's the way of the world. When Anderson wrote it, he originally gave it a different ending. He originally had that the emperor's subjects just admired the clothes and everyone in the town pretended to lie and continued on with it. And the manuscript was actually already at the printers when Anderson went up and said that he wanted to change the ending. Historians think that there's a couple of reasons why he might have wanted to change it, such as when Anderson himself met the king when he was a young child and he met King Frederick VI and Anderson supposedly said afterwards, oh, he's nothing more than a human being. There's also the idea that Anderson presented himself to the Danish bourgeoisie as a naive and precocious child and the Emperor's New Clothes was then his expose of the hypocrisy and snobbery that he found within the Danish bourgeoisie. 
There was also a lovely um, anecdote that said that after he had written this tale, the king then presented him with some gifts of rubies and diamonds because the Empress New Clothes and another of Anderson's tales, the swineherd, he actually voices a satirical disrespect for the court. So the king was trying to pay him off so that he stopped writing tales of political sapphire and instead wrote lovely stories like The Ugly Duckling, which is actually one that he made up entirely by himself and didn't come from previous stories. What happens in The Emperor's New Clothes is basically a almost textbook case of mass hysteria. In this case, it's mainly motivated by trying to please the royals. Everyone's trying to, you know, not get fired, which happens in workplaces a lot. But historically, there have been many cases of large groups of people all behaving in a strange manner all at the same time. We've actually spoken about this on the podcast before. We spoke about the dancing plagues of uh, 1518 in Strasbourg. In relation to the Pied Piper of Hamlet. The main mechanism through which they work is still largely unknown. What happens is basically people transmit illusions of threats or rumours and that influences behaviour. And especially in small, tight-knit communities, this can uh, happen quite fast. There's an example of this recorded in an 1844 medical textbook speaking about something that happened in some time in the 1400s where a nun in a French convent began meowing and all the other nuns also began meowing. Eventually, the, all the nuns began meowing together at the same time every day. And the, this meowing didn't even didn't stop until the police threatened to whip the nuns for disturbing the community. Other examples include one of the most famous ones, uh, the Salem Witch Trials, um, which often gets uh, carted out as a the dangers of false accusation, dangers of isolationism, um, and the dang- and the dangers of mass hysteria. Uh, This resulted in the execution of 20 citizens and in nearby towns, all accused of practicing witchcraft. Going a bit further forward, in 1938, we had the Halifax Slasher. In the town of Halifax in England, two women claimed to have been attacked by a mysterious man with a mallet and bright buckles on his shoes. And then further reports of a man wielding a knife and a razor came in and the situation became so serious that Scotland Yard was called in to assist the Halifax police to catch this uh, Halifax Slasher. But then one of the victims admitted that He'd actually inv- inflicted the damage on himself just for attention. Soon after that admission, uh, other people came through and eventually they determined that none of the attacks had been real, but everyone in the town had been whipped into a furor because of this fear of this attacker. So we've been talking about the psychology of mass delusions, which are pretty relevant to the Emperor's New Clothes, and we decided to get on an expert. So we asked our friend Holly, who has an honours in psychology and then has spent the last five years working in population health research. So thank you so much for coming on our show, Holly. Oh, thank you for having me. It's lovely (laughs) to be here. (laughs) So we have a couple of questions for you in relation to the Emperor's New Clothes. Holly, how does mass delusion work? Such a cop-out way to start an answer, but that is a really good question. And I think that these sort of like group psychology and anything to do with this sort of thinking of lots of different individual people is something that's really interesting. Um, I think these stories like The Emperor's New Clothes remind us of some of the really dark aspects of humanity and what it means to be a part of a species that's this intelligent, but also this sort of social and so dependent on the impacts and the outcomes of these sort of social hierarchies and the way that we interact with one another. Um, And so it's hard not to see, you know, parallels with those real life examples when you talk about things like, you know, the Heaven's Gate cult and things like that, where they, um, these otherwise sort of educated functional members of society committed a mass suicide in order to like graduate, quote unquote, from their human form and transcend their consciousness as an alien spaceship was passing by the Earth. So I haven't heard of the Heaven's Gate cult before. How many people was that that were part of that mass suicide? Well, it was actually 39 people who all at this one moment in time, um, it's very much that kind of um, Jonestown punch sort of approach where there was this um, hail bop comet, I think it was called, that was like meant to be passing overhead at this specific time. And the members of this cult believed that um, they needed to sort of transcend their physical forms at the time that this comet was passing over the earth in order to like transcend, I suppose, and become one with this like greater existence. And like, it's really interesting as well, because like when we talk about delusions, I think it's important to kind of differentiate between like 
like mass delusions and mass hysteria. And like um, there's something else that they call like mass psychogenic illness. Mm. And so there have been these cases where otherwise healthy people have come down with these sort of like physical ailments of different kinds. So whether it's like uh, twitching or fainting or um, weird physical behaviours or like different types of pain and things like that that can just sort of spread through a community with no attributable physical cause. But a delusion is a bit different. It's more an idiosyncratic belief or impression that you maintain despite contradicting evidence. This is a delusion because, and this is what made me think that we needed to sort of differentiate this is that um some of the members of this cult were actually like returning their telescopes and things like that because they'd bought telescopes to see this comet coming in its trajectory yeah. couldn't find it and so they've then returned their telescopes because they've rationalized this as the telescopes need to be faulty because the comet is there yeah, okay. um yeah. so it's the maintenance it's of that belief yeah. despite contradiction sort of evidence or reality are there any uh, factors that lead into this sort of mass delusion? Like any common factors? I think this is one of the reasons that these sort of things are so interesting to people because there's a lot of debate about like what the possible reasons for this actually are because obviously whether it's the psychogenic illness um, or the mass delusion, like just the logistics of how this actually happens is really complex because you can sort of, you can understand how one person's thinking can become like disordered or diluted based on like their experiences or like a mental illness or like, you know, brains are complicated. And if different things go wrong, like we can see how that can manifest in lots of different ways. What's really hard to explain about these sort of mass delusions is how does, how does a whole group of people uh, go down this same idiosyncratic path of thinking and how do they all sort of not respond to the evidence and things like that. So there's, um, I don't know if you've heard of it, something called folie adieu, which is um, like dual madness. And so it's this idea and it's often between people who are in like romantic partnerships or like these very close sort of like one-on-one -on -one relationships where they will have these sort of uh, shared dual kind of delusions. And there's this really quite an active debate as to whether this is a real concept, whether it's actually possible for two people to be deluded mm -hmm. in the same way or whether there's like one person who is like fully in the delusion and another person who either like sort of you know, wants to believe or is kind of enabling or those that, beliefs. Yeah, and things acquiescing like that. to those beliefs. Acquiescing is a very interesting word choice. And I think I think there is a really core question there, which is, is, is a mass delusion something that can exist or does it have to be something that's got a bit more to do with that acquiescence and that natural tendency okay. for people to sort of want to fit into a group and have that sort of sense of place and social cohesion? We wanted to ask you about the psychology of acquiescence because from the sound of it, bit a bit more into acquiescing it's, rather than... It's hard to really tease it apart mm. because obviously, like, you know, 39 people isn't everyone in the world sort of thing. So there are limitations to how kind of compelling this sort of acquiescence or delusion can be. So I think like you could put forward a solid argument for either. So humans are a really social species and our societies often tend to gravitate towards hierarchies. So in evolutionary psychology, there's an argument that we actually feel social rejection in a similar way that we would feel physical pain. Um, and so because of that, we go to great lengths to avoid feeling rejected by social groups. It is important to acknowledge that evolutionary psychology, while it gives us some really compelling kind of ideas, doesn't <laughs> lend itself to the kind of falsifiable hypotheses that we do really love in a lot of science. So uh, that's a difficult one. But we do have a lot of, there is a lot of research on acquiescence and how humans will respond in these kind of social situations. And one really famous example is the ash line studies from the 1950s. <laughs> really straightforward, but really powerful kind of social psychology experiments. So they would put people in this kind of like classroom environment and, you know, you'd be like one participant in this class full of other people. The experiment was that other than the one participant in the room, everyone else in the classroom was in on the experiment. And so they'd hold up two lines that were like really, really obvious obviously very different lengths and every single other person in the classroom would be like oh well, they're the same and so what they found and I'm sure you know where I'm going with this is that most people would actually 
acquiesce. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll be like, yep, no, they're the same length. Even like knowing that it's wrong. Like it, there's nothing ambiguous about this situation. It's very much, um, I think, comparable to our sort of emperor's new clothes mm -hmm. situation. It's just being directly confronted with like just wrongness. Yeah. And one of the things as well is that people often tend to have a bit of that kind of like self-doubt. So we often look to other people in our social group for answers when we're not sure of the situation. So in something like this, you might start off pretty sure, mm. but when everyone else is like convinced that these lines are the same length or so you think, there's a natural kind of tendency to assume that maybe we've got something wrong and to sort of check yourself and like often people will go with the group answer, especially if there's someone else that they perceive as like an authority or an expert in that group because they'll second guess themselves, but they'll trust the group. And it sort of, again, like leads back to that whole sort of Humans are pretty much useless on our own, but we are very good once we are in a society and we're all sort of working together. But that does come with some pretty interesting drawbacks, which I think, you know, what's really highlighted by this Emperor's New Clothes story is that sometimes it's so damaging and so the consequences are so high of violating these norms or disrupting these hierarchies um, that exist in the societies that we exist in that it's easier to either just like acquiesce and agree with what's being said or potentially to convince yourself that you are wrong and they're seeing something that, you know, you're just missing because clearly you're an idiot and everyone else can see that the lines are the same, that the emperor is wearing fantastic clothes and you must be the one who's like screwed something up. So unless you want to end up off on your own. So there is one person who in our story doesn't really fall into this power of acquiescing and that is the child who instead even though everyone around him is saying that the emperor is wearing his delightful suit mm. says no he doesn't actually have anything on <laughs> so we thought that we'd ask you about children and how they don't particularly fit into that power of acquiescing well right off the bat I think there's a there's a definite truthiness to that isn't it I'm sure we've all been asked a question or heard a child ask a question every now and then where you'd be like, oh, oh, you did not think about the effect it would have on that person to ask that question, did you? Well, first of all, it is pretty demonstrable that it takes a little while to become an adult. There's a lot of processes and brain development and things we need to learn and neural pathways that need to be consolidated as a function of that learning. It takes until you're 25 before your brain is fully That's developed. That's absolutely right. And so the last part of your brain to develop, because it sort of happens in stages um, and with your cortical areas, which are the outside bits that do all the human stuff, these are the sort of structures that have evolved later in development, but they also develop later in your life, sort of of things. So uh, it tends to start from the back and move forward. So things like motor function and things like that will be refined a lot more quickly than some of these more complex social processes. So you see, you know, like, like a 12 year old or something and physically in a lot of ways, like they can do most of the stuff that adults can do, especially if they practice a specific skill set and things like that. But emotionally, cognitively, there's still a lot more development to happen. So a lot of things uh, obviously happen during puberty, a lot of emotional kind of attachment and regulation and reward systems and things like that. But um, this processing of like the sort of longer term, higher order, more abstract connections and consequences of your actions is one of the last things to develop. So that's one of the ones that actually comes in right around that 25 mark. So kids don't have that same kind of like reason to take pause and sort of consider like, oh, what are all the things that could happen here? And I like biologically and experientially, like, I don't know about you, but I feel like a lot of people have a real crash course in social politics and hierarchies and the potential unintended consequences of small things that people say when they go through high school. And by the time you come out of that, you sort of, you know, you're not prepared for a lot of situations that you're going to have in work, but you've kind of got this mental map of like, oh, like, these are the potential consequences that these actions can have. So you sort of start... Someone to... turns up naked. You can't tell them that they're naked. You can't That's not a anything. thing. It's not what people do. It's just, it's not the done thing. Well, thank you so much for coming on and having a chat to us, Holly. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for letting me. <laughs> uh, so the tale of the Empress New Clothes, it is about mass delusions, but I also think it's a lot about tailoring and I suppose the inventiveness of creativity of these tailors. And at the time, making a fabric that was invisible to some people, but visible to others, wasn't particularly possible. But nowadays, we're almost on the verge of making being able to make something like 
that happen. So we decided to speak to Stephanie Turwin about her passion project, which is making clothes. Hi. How's it going? Yeah, not bad. Steph, I've known you for a number of years now, and you're a bit of a talent at making your own costumes. I am, although I don't just do costumes, I also do day wear and arts and crafts, a bit of everything really. And as someone who uses a lot of different fabrics, we thought we might talk to you about some of the current innovations in fabrics and how people make fabrics. So I've just been doing a bit of research and there's been some amazing innovations and we've come very far from the original using flax fibres to dye clothes. Do you have a favourite fabric that you like working with? Oh, see, this is a hard one because I have favorite fabrics that I like to wear and that I like in clothing, but they're actually probably some of the most horrible fabrics to work with as a seamstress. So, for example, I really, really love um, chiffon as a fabric. It drapes beautifully. It looks glorious when you're making skirts or dresses, and it just has a really nice wow factor. But it is so slippery and so hard to pin together and to keep in place while you're sewing it that is actually the worst and probably my most hated fabric to use in sewing, even though I love it as a garment. So usually worth it in the end, but while you're making it, sort of agony. hating every the whole thing? Yeah. Absolute agony. <laughs> At the moment, personally, I'm trying when I'm looking for clothes and looking to buy clothes, I try and go for ones that are made sustainably because the actual process of making fabrics can be really harmful to the environment. Do you have any knowledge of current sustainable methods of making clothes and how that might differ from traditional methods? Yeah, definitely. So I guess there's a couple of elements here. And if we think to, you know, really uh, more traditional clothes in the modern sense, you're thinking of uh, natural fibres like cotton or linen or silk. Um, and they aren't always produced in the most sustainable way, particularly a fibre like cotton. Uh, it's a highly water intense crop to, to grow and traditional cotton farming actually uses a lot of chemicals and pesticides in its production. So there's that whole element of producing the cotton. Um, but then there's also the aspect of how the fabrics are produced once you have your, your thread elements, I guess you could say. Uh, so that's the more traditional side of things. And then as you get into the synthetic world, um, then we're into the area of, you know, uh, single-use plastics almost. And your clothing can almost be regarded that way because as much as you use clothing over, you know, the period of a couple months or a couple of years, depending on your taste and your preferences, uh, once a garment is used, it's very hard to recover those plastic fibres that have gone into making the polyester or lycra that is making up your garment. So there's a big issue around reusing those plastic fibres as well. Uh, what we are starting to see though is a lot of businesses that are looking to alternative natural fibres. So there's a fibre called Tensile which was actually developed in Australia which is made from eucalyptus tree pulp, I believe, and they use that to make the threads which they will then weave into the fabric. And it's a much more sustainable crop than something like cotton while still being a natural fiber. What you're also seeing is companies trying to reduce waste the way they make the garments. So traditionally, when you are making garments, you have a large piece of fabric, you cut pattern pieces out of it, and you connect all the pattern pieces together to make your shirt or your dress or your pants. What some companies are doing is weaving fabric or knitting fabric specifically to the pattern pieces so that they don't have to cut the pattern out and they also won't have any excess fabric as waste. So they're really able to custom make all of their garments and also reduce the waste in the manufacturing process. So I know that people are also making fabrics from a lot of really, really, you'd almost say bizarre things nowadays. So one of my favorite brands is Allbirds, which makes shoes from merino wool first, but then they've also started making shoes from tree fibers and most recently, I think from sugar plants, they've started making flip flops from these. And I think there's also some companies that will make clothes out of plastic bottles. Funnily enough, a, uh, a friend of mine has started her own swimwear label and 
all of the bikinis in her swimwear range made of lycra that is produced from recycled plastics like plastic bottles or fishing lines and stuff like that. And it's actually becoming increasingly common in particularly swimwear, I think, as there's that connection to the ocean and people are talking a lot about, you know, uh, cleaning the oceans and removing the plastic from our oceans. And so there's this move to take that plastic, repurpose it into fabric and then make swimwear out of it, which is fantastic. I realise that we can't predict what's going to happen in the future, but if you were to try and predict what will happen in terms of fabric, where could you see it going? Oh, this is a hard one because I think there's a lot of work that's already underway or that people are already starting to test that I think in the very near future we'll see and it will be a reality. So I think we're going to continue seeing this push towards recycling fabrics. I know that H&M have actually been testing recycling garment fabrics, so pulling apart old garments, reusing the threads from that and creating new fabrics from scratch. So I think we're going to see more of that. We're going to see more reusing other um, other natural fibre sources or plastics or whatever to create new fabrics. Um, I think we're also going to start testing or playing with other ways of making fabrics, so not just weaving in a traditional sense, but 3D printing or a mix of 3D printing and weaving. And we are also starting to see that happen. Thanks so much for chatting to us about that, Steph. So the history of clothing is a very, very long one. And people have said that people have been wearing clothes for between 500,000 to 100,000 years ago. And of course, it's evolved a fair bit since then. About 30,000 years ago, people made needles. When people used to make fabrics, and this is how they would have done it at the time of the Emperor's New Clothes, the story, you would harvest and clean your fibre and wool, then you'd cart it and spin it into threads, weave the threads into cloth, and then finally fashion and sew the cloth into different clothes. And this sort of technology, it's people have said that you can find it from about 30,000 years ago. But it's pretty hard to find a lot of history about fabrics because of course they rot. People have mainly guessed this based on the tools that they found and imprints that they found about things. Nowadays there's actually, I went down such a rabbit hole when I was looking at this and poor T has seen the amount of pages of notes that I have. I found a whole bunch of odd things that I never would have suspected that you could use to make fabrics such as orange fibre which is this company in Italy who's trying to find a way to use the 700,000 tonnes of orange peel discarded yearly in order to create juice. And they make a material similar to viscose blended with silk and cotton. And if you know anything about brand name Salvatore Ferragamo, who makes beautiful, amazing high-end clothes, actually use this fabric to create a capsule collection. There's also companies making bioplastics from potato waste, which is this company, Chipsboard, which makes a fabric, Parblex. And they are working with the potato company, McCain's, in order to use their potato waste from their wedges and so on and all their other potato products. And the company has a zero waste production system because even the offcuts of their material production is incorporated back into the system. There's legitimately so many weird ones out there. I found ones using Great Mark to make leathers, to make vegan leathers. There's lots and lots of different types of ones. You can make them from pineapple skin. There's hemp fibres now have turned out to be a very fantastic material because they're antibacterial, durable, resilient. However, there are a few problems with using hemp hemp fibres because the growth is often limited as people are a little bit worried about that whole connection to cannabis. There's clothes made out of coffee ground fibres. So just think the next time you have your coffee, the the grounds could also actually be used by a Taiwanese company to turn into a different type of yarn. And that company, Syntex, is working with Starbucks to take the coffee grounds and use them to make fabrics. Banana fibres, lotus fibres is a super high-tech one. And also supposedly makes really high-end ones. And then there's even just new companies that are making different types of fabric, like Stone Island, which is working with reflective glass microbeads and temperature-sensitive outerwear. So we've come a pretty long way since the Empress time. And though we might not have 
invisible fabric just yet. There are some really cool options. All right, so hopefully you've learned a little bit about the Emperor's New Clothes, um, how to avoid being caught up in a mass delusion. And also if anyone tells you that the fabric you're wearing looks fantastic but you can't see it, do not trust them because <laughs> it is most likely that they are lying. This is actually the final episode of Crumbs of Science. We hope you've had as much fun listening to this as we have had recording it. And we'd just like to thank uh, the ANU uh, Centre for the Public Awareness of Science for their use of their uh, recording facilities. We'd like to thank uh, Will Grant for getting us set up in this space. To all our guests that came along and gave us interviews and answered such bizarre questions yeah, from we, us. We hope we didn't get anyone fired. And, yeah, that's it from Crumbs of Science. If you have any questions in the future, please feel free to email us at crumbsofscience at gmail.com. Until next time, we hope you have... A happily, happily ever, ever after. after.